Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Didi Lagesson, Executive Secretary for the Committee on the Present Danger China. We have an outstanding lineup of experts to discuss communist China's mobilization for war and America's preparedness for such a conflict. A video of this webinar will post to presentdangerchina.org within a day or two of the conclusion of our program. Please share with your colleagues and other networks. Our moderator today is Frank Gaffney. Frank is the executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy, host of Securing America TV on Real America's Voice, and vice chair for the Committee on the Present Danger China. With that, Frank, let's get started. Welcome to you all for this particularly momentous, I think, certainly very timely Committee on the Present Danger China webinar on the transition that China seems to be making from normal to war and what we are doing about it. Uh, my name is Frank Gaffney. I am privileged to be both the executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy and the vice chairman of the Committee on the Present Danger China, which is presenting, of course, this weekly series. I hope that you will continue to uh, look to us at uh, Thursday mornings, th Thursday afternoons, I should say, 1 p.m. Eastern time for more of this incredibly important programming about the China threat. And again, what the United States must do to respond to it. We're going to be talking at a moment when serious challenges are clearly emerging from China. Uh, we have a very impressive panel of experts to talk about different aspects of it. I'll just take a moment or two to set the stage. Uh, we are all, of course, now uh, acquainted to varying degrees with the dangers that emanate from China, not least because virtually every American has been impacted directly, in some cases, mortally, by the Chinese Communist Party virus, also known as uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We're talking in the aftermath of uh, some of its predations in this country. We're talking at a moment when the Chinese themselves continue ruthlessly to lock down their most important cities, including Shanghai and even Beijing. We're gonna talk a bit about what that's about and we'll do so in part informed by a tremendously interesting, albeit of somewhat uncertain provenance video that I think will illuminate many of the topics that we're talking about today. It is described as a video recording of a top secret meeting that occurred in uh, Guangdong province on the 14th of May, and appears to be senior party officials and military personnel discussing the implementation of national direction from Beijing to prepare for the transition, as it's been put, from normal to war. We're gonna discuss with our panel what that might mean in terms of war with whom, and when, and to what effect. We're also going to talk about another very important, perhaps providential insight, uh, leaks from uh, hackers, or I should say hackers that leaked information about what is going on at the hands of the communist Chinese to Uyghur Muslims and other minorities in what the locals call East Turkestan and the Chinese call Xinjiang province in the West. It illuminates the ongoing and very real genocidal oppression of those people and is I think illustrative of what the Chinese Communist Party is doing to others to varying degrees elsewhere across the country. All of these are things that will, I hope, make our conversation both um, more relevant to those of you who are wondering, where are we going with China? Especially perhaps against the backdrop of a speech by 
Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, today, in which he made it sound as though um, few, if any, of those other issues are of concern to the Biden administration, um, which may further reinforce the impression that this trip that the president took this past week to Asia was not simply a matter of um, uh, sort of incoherence, but actually reflects a policy that is uh, very misinformed and potentially very dangerous indeed. To begin our conversation about these topics and more, I'm delighted to have the chairman of the Committee on the Present Danger of China, Brian Kennedy, as our first presenter. Brian is the former president of a highly acclaimed think tank on the West Coast, the Claremont Institute. These days, he is the president of the American Strategy Group, as well as, of course, uh, the leader of our committee. And we're very pleased to have him with us. Um, Brian, over to you. Thank you, Frank. It's, uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, by way of introduction, let me just say, someone asked me, why are we holding all these seminars? And Frank really has been a great intellectual resource in driving these topics. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate everything Frank is doing and everybody on this panel is doing to try to explain to the American people the threat posed by communist China to the United States. Frank and I and others have been saying for, for many years that we as a nation underestimate communist China. In the, in the history of this country, we tend to look at a country we don't like, who you know, postures itself as an enemy against the United States, behaves like an enemy of the United States, and, and we tend to somehow diminish them. But in fact, the Chinese Communist Party has 90 million members who are capable of controlling 1.4 billion people. And they have a first world military and they are very, very determined people when it comes to dominating both China itself and the world more broadly. And so if there's one takeaway you can take, you can, you know, get from today and the other work that the Committee on the Present Danger China engages, it is to not underestimate communist China. They are extremely capable. And so when they go through elaborate planning and spend enormous resources on a project, know that it's for a purpose. And that purpose is to be the master country on earth, to dominate the earth. And so that everything we have to say is in that regard. They mean to be the hegemon of the, of the world. That's on the one hand. Now, when you look at this recording, and again, we don't know the exact uh, source of it, but we do know when you listen to it or read the transcript, you see, in a way, a very mundane rendition of the things that they're going to have to do to carry out what they say is a national mobilization order to engage in combat and to take back Taiwan. Now, a national mobilization order, it suggests, was sent down. And now this provincial party committee in Guangdong is responding to it and engaging in the kind of mundane planning you would need to do in order to carry that out. And that's the work of not a week or a month, but probably months to prepare. They're talking about preparing ships, preparing the medical uh, equipment and and uh, facilities that can actually uh, deal with casualties. They're talking about all sorts of retrofitting of both uh, construction and production in Guangdong province and, and for ships and for basically the, the various components of whatever war machine they need to be building. And so that sort of mundane explanation would give you the impression that, that this is serious, serious planning on their part. And it seems realistic that you would have to engage in this kind of planning. They go into detail about a variety of things that, that 
I'm sure Jeff and, and Brad will, will be discussing. But the, what struck me was as extremely interesting is that they were talking about the need for their police departments to look at the mega cities of Guangzhou and Shenzhen and to prepare for dealing with large scale riots from people within those cities, what they call mega cities, who may be rioting given the conditions that they find themselves in. That's the kind of planning one does not engage in lightly. And the mere fact that this became public should suggest to US policymakers that they need to be prepared for war. And the concern we have on the Committee on the Present Danger China is that we're not doing that. So that's, my, that's really my second point, that this does seem very real. My final point is that the Chinese know today that they have a unique opportunity to exploit American weaknesses and lack of preparedness. Today, the United States is going to have a very tough time engaging militarily with the Chinese communists. We today don't have a missile defense should things escalate to the level of a nuclear conflict. We don't have a missile defense as much as one gets talked about. And so if the Chinese decide to go nuclear, we're going to be ill-prepared uh, to deal with that here in the United States. Uh, the second thing is that we today have a military that's really designed for fighting land wars in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And we have a military leadership that thinks in those terms. And, and they've not broken through to what it will genuinely take to fight a war against communist China. Now, there's all, all sorts of discussions over the years about a pivot to Asia, but I and others don't see that actually transferring itself to how the United States is preparing for war today and preparing for our own national defense. That should be of great concern. The third thing the Chinese know, and this may be among the most critical, is that there is an enormous amount of internal strife here in the United States. Our major cities are in crisis. This fall, there's going to be a, a um, midterm election. And so the country is going to be focused on that and not external affairs. And then there's also just the fact that we've seen in 2020 a big election year radical leftist organizations within the United States engaging in uh, an organized effort to attack America's big cities, to intimidate the American people, and to engage in the kind of dissension that would weaken the United States internally and force most Americans to focus on that rather than an external threat. And so one of the things that gets talked about in this meeting in Guangdong is the need to mobilize overseas Chinese to help with the execution of the war. And so what they're, what they're directly saying is we have all these millions of people around the world who are Chinese, who are on our side, whether they are or they aren't is kind of secondary. There are enough of them that are either a directly agents of the Chinese Communist Party or could be agents of the Chinese Communist Party who will engage in their minds in some activity here in this country in order to weaken the United States as they carry out war in Taiwan. Now, the combination of all these things is something that American military planners seem very ill-prepared to deal with. We don't see discussions of this coming from, from certainly the Biden administration uh, or for that matter from Congress. And so part of the purpose of what we're doing here today is to highlight for you this potential crisis, which is looking more and more real, and to add, to ask you to, to join with us to, to explain to our countrymen just what's going on. And again, to, to make sure that we're as prepared as possible for the crises ahead. So with that, let me thank you for again, joining us today and turn it back over to Frank.
thank you for your kind words about my involvement in this committee, but thank you most especially for your leadership of it. And, and I want to just underscore one thing you said, which I think is of profound importance uh, to just how far along the Chinese are in these preparations. And that is the point that was made in the video, as you say, that the Chinese have been using these lockdowns as part of their preparation of their population for the hardships, the sacrifices, the control that the party will exercise on them if and when this war um, launches. And uh, that helps explain something that a lot of us have been somewhat mystified by uh, in terms of the extent, the duration, and the uh, unbelievable hardships involved in this uh, uh, quarantining and otherwise uh, really imprisoning the people of uh, many of the major cities of China. To give us another perspective on all of this, I'm delighted to have another member of our Committee on the Present Danger of China, one of its founding members at that, Dr. Bradley Thayer. Um, he has extensive experience both as a scholar and as a, uh, well, a professor uh, concerning what China is about under the Chinese Communist Party, um, its long-term objectives, uh, and a racist quality to its uh, policy and ambitions that is not often even noted, let alone given, I think, the importance it is due. Uh, this is uh, evident in a subtitle of his uh, most recent book, How China Sees the World, Han Centrism and the Balance of Power in International Politics. Uh, Brad is a frequent contributor to other outlets, uh, notably The Hill newspaper and Epic Times, um, but he is uh, a go-to resource on so many of these issues, and we're really thrilled that he was able to join us today. Brad, your thoughts on where we stand now with respect to China, how we've gotten to this point historically, and uh, where you th think things are going to go from here. Uh, thank you, Frank. It's a great pleasure and honor to join you uh, today, and my appreciation as well to Brian for his comments and uh, very insightful remarks uh, for, to you for hosting it and for uh, Didi, of course, uh, and Oleg for making this possible. Um, what I would like to do, Frank, is address those topics really centering on two major issues, uh, the significance of uh, the May 14th meeting, uh, again, which was leaked, uh, for China and for uh, the United States. Um, and with respect to China, uh, the implications of this um, uh, meeting are very significant for the reasons that Brian has already mentioned and which you have uh, touched on uh, as well in your remarks. What I would add to that is really to place this meeting in the context of uh, Chinese Communist Party thought and um, if you will, Chinese strategic culture. Uh, the meeting is significant uh, because it is um, an indication that the Chinese believe that strategic advantage now is ripe. Uh, the Chinese have an idea, what they call sure, or the idea in essence of strategic advantage, that events are moving in their direction, the way that they want events to develop, and in a way which is not propitious for the adversary, uh, for the United States, for Japan, Australia, uh, India, and Taiwan uh, in this instance. So the meeting is illuminating because as Brian observed, it seems an order has come down and that you can see uh, in Guangdong, and we would expect many other um, uh, instances as well, that they are planning the offensive measures that they're going to be need to take uh, to prepare for this, but also defensive measures uh, within the city, of course, to deal with the civil problems, but also uh, incumbent problems that would affect the party as well. So they believe that events are moving in their direction, and that's quite alarming uh, for the United States, its allies, uh, and all states that seek to resist uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Second significant element of this uh, for China uh, is their idea of a pre-crisis action. Normally we think of an in international politics or events that there's a, a peacetime 
there's crisis and there's war. Uh, the Chinese have a notion of pre-crisis where they seek to act in peacetime to set the stage for um, a surprise attack uh, to be directed that would lead to a crisis or that would lead to a conflict. So we're seeing emphasis that they uh, are in a pre-crisis situation. They are taking actions, mobilizations, uh, to which we're not responding uh, as we should. We've seen this before in history. We've seen this with uh, the Chinese intervention uh, in the Korean War, uh, where they acted while the UN uh, was unaware of the steps that they were taking. The Chinese were acting uh, assiduously uh, to intervene uh, in force uh, in October and November 1950. So we see elements which are akin to that in this, a pre-crisis action, a pre-crisis mobilization uh, to take us by surprise and to take the Taiwanese uh, surprise. And that should be thought of again as uh, their idea of strategic advantage, that what they're doing is uh, what they can to ensure that they're uh, going to capitalize uh, on these events and surprise the world uh, with an attack or other coercive measures directed against Taiwan, Japan, India, uh, the states of uh, Southeast Asia uh, and the United States, any or, or all of those above. The second big point I'd like to make is with respect to the United States. The United States labors under a serious problem and that is the fog of peace. Uh, by the fog of peace, I mean that we expect because there was no war yesterday and there doesn't seem to be one today uh, that there won't be tomorrow. The U.S. seeks to maintain the status quo in international politics, and so it's less sensitive to adverse changes uh, than China is. And the Chinese Communist Party, of course, has the reverse motivation. It seeks to change the status quo uh, in international politics and is doing so actively uh, in, um, in every different area, diplomatically, economically, politically, militarily. So the United States is laboring under this fog of peace, which desensitizes us, which blinds us to obvious steps that the Chinese are taking. The May 14th meeting is a very clear signal uh, to penetrate uh, this fog of peace. And that should call and re require the Biden administration, of course, but as Brian observed, uh, American society, the, our allies, uh, countries around the world which seek to resist the Chinese Communist Party, that the Chinese are moving towards war and they're moving towards war in the near term. Uh, and so that is uh, extremely alarming. And we need to essentially have the scales uh, fall from our eyes. We need to be able to recognize their signals as they develop. And this is an acute one and a very strong one. Uh, so the May 14th meeting is alarming and Americans need to be aware of it and put pressure, of course, uh, on our elected representatives and the Biden administration uh, to respond uh, actively and forcefully, militarily, diplomatically, uh, economically, so that we're able to deter uh, an attack against Taiwan or against other states. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Brad, thank you for your contribution to this program. I think if nothing else, um, this term fog of peace is brilliant and it really does capture uh, a kind of, I guess what the psychologist might call a cognitive dissonance when confronted with unpleasant or unwelcome evidence of Chinese intentions uh, to become more violently belligerent in addition to the unrestricted warfare that China has been engaged in against us for decades, uh, a frequent subject of our work at the Committee on the Present Danger of China and this series in particular, that fog of peace is clearly uh, disabling some of the prudent and indeed necessary responses that uh, we're going to be talking about now, I think, with uh, another member of our committee on the present danger, China, J.R. Nyquist, uh, known to his friends as Jeff. He is a remarkably brilliant, uh, both observer and analyst of 
strategic matters of great import uh, to nations like ours, uh, part historian, part close observer of the present scene, and part, um, I think, very, very thoughtful forecaster of what is likely to come. He is the author of numerous books, including The Origins of the Fourth World War, a topic that seems highly relevant to our present conversation. And of course, uh, blogs very, very constructively and I, I think uh, importantly at jrnyquist.blog. Uh, Jeff, it's great to have you with us as well. Um, I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on uh, what has been said so far, as well as uh, your insights about where we ought to go from here, given what we've just been discussing. Well, Frank, thank you. Um... The first thing I'd like to frame everything with, the Wall Street Journal had an article on uh, May 19th. The headline was, China insists party elites shed overseas assets, eyeing Western assets. Um, you know, this is, they're, they're preparing to seize Western assets in their country. They want to get their assets out of other countries. This is a war preparation. They've been stockpiling food. They've been stockpiling fuel and other raw materials. War preparation. Um, if you look at other evidence, excuse me, <clears throat> the lockdowns, the port closures, all on this uh, uh, claim that they're having a uh, problem with COVID is very convenient. But it, it seems that if we put it all together, China is preparing for war. And it is, uh, as we just heard, um, short term, in the short term. Um, about this... Uh, audio recording uh, leaked out of uh, Guangdong from the standing party meeting held on May 14th, I'm told, involving top military and civil officials. Um, I've analyzed some of the interesting things in there. Uh, the preparations seem to point to a date of starting the war 90 days at the least, 90 days from May 14th to up to November 1st. And I'm told by the sources that got the leak there are other sources indicate the Communist Party wants the war to start before November 1st. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the decision for war apparently was made in April. The date April 18th is, is tossed around coming from the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. The logistical preparations are on a scale that dwarfs the Normandy invasion. If you start to add up the tonnage of the ships that they even mention, over 950 ships of various sizes, 64 10,000 ton railroad ships. That is now Taiwan has 170,000 standing army, a million reservists. Uh, any military strategy just would say, uh, this is an Olympic, Operation Olympic style, like when we've contemplated invading, invading Japan. <clears throat> this is the scale we're talking about. This is the kind of difficulty. Uh, would the Chinese actually conduct an invasion on that scale? And But there is a problem with this, which I'll get to later. Uh, because, you know, you're invading an island that has a potential of defense, and, and the terrain in the island is mostly mountainous. Much of the flat ground is urban. Uh, how do you actually pull this off? Uh, especially with the amount of uh, armor they're apparently getting ready to load on these 64 10,000 ton row row ships. Uh, the most effective way you would think that they would take Taiwan is blockade. The island can't feed itself. Uh, it would only be a matter of time if you were able to control the water and air around it. Why would you bother invading it? And how could you invade it unless you control the air and water around it, right? So there's a, there's a funny thing here. A lot of islands in World War II that were really tough, we went around. We didn't invade them. Uh, there's no strategic reason to directly invade it, but this recording suggests that they're going to invade Taiwan. Um, the most disturbing part of the recording for me, again, is these, these 64, 10,000 ton row row ships. This is simply too much in the way of mechanized forces for an island with this kind of terrain. And uh, this would, to give you an idea, uh, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in 1941 with less vehicles than these ships can carry. And that, by the way, this is just one province. In the southern, um, 
theater military command. The actual command that would be overseeing an invasion is the Eastern theater military command. They have vast resources, probably even more resources. They have larger troop numbers than does the Southern theater command. So this is very strange and it is somewhat alarming. And um, the recording of the province officials discusses something else that's disturbing. They discuss fears of an American, at one point, the the commissar, the political commissar, whose name is Wang Xu uh, Jin, talks about rallying the people of the province, if there is civil unrest, uh, by blaming the Americans for the counterattacks on their territory. And in, in this discussion of uh, targets in Guangdong, they're listing strategic targets like nu the four nuclear power stations in the province. This is disturbing because a counterattack from the United States is suggestive of an attack on the United States. Um, that is disturbing. Um, I, should, uh, I should like to quote, there is in this context, a very important speech General Chiao Chen uh, made. He was the defense minister. This speech was about 20 years ago. Um, he was talking about using biological weapons on the United States to clean up America, that a biological attack was what they wanted to organize, that they had to go to war with America, that it was inevitable. Uh, and here's a quote from the end of that speech, which in, in the context of this mobilization we're seeing is particularly disturbing. So here's the quote from General Xiao Chen. As long as we resolve the United States problem at one blow, our domestic problems will all be readily solved. Therefore, our military battle preparation appears to aim at Taiwan, but in fact is aimed at the United States. And the preparation is far beyond the scope of attacking aircraft carriers and satellites. So that's, that's kind of what I want to leave everybody with, um, my thoughts on it. But I thank you very much, Jeff, for that extraordinarily important presentation. In particular, I think the uh, the remarks that you've cited by Chi Hao Chen, the former, at the time, the defense minister of China about 20 years ago, are staggeringly important. And when you tie it in with uh, this recent uh, insight into apparently putting these plans into uh, effect, and you combine it with what certainly seems to be a dress rehearsal, if not an actual first run at a biological weapons attack against this country, among others to be sure, but against this country in particular, um, it is a, well, a staggeringly uh, ominous situation we have on our hands at this juncture. Um, Frank, do you have audio running in the background? I do not. I apologize if something else is going on. Um, is there, is that any better? Yeah, I'm hearing a speech in the background that you're good. Go ahead. I am so sorry. Apologies to all of you. I don't know what that is. Um, the point I, I really would like to begin our Q&A or interactions amongst the panelists uh, and then hopefully some questions from you all as well with is, um, and maybe Brad to you, uh, the speech that uh, Tony Blinken gave today uh, seems to be extraordinarily out of touch with any of the realities that we've just discussed. Uh, I'm not sure that he mentioned a military threat from China at all. Uh, it seems as though it was almost entirely um, redolent of this idea that, that, that they're just competitors of ours. And uh, as long as we can compete with them successfully and cooperate with them where we need to, uh, all is going to be well. Um, am I missing something or is, does this really bespeak at the very least a cluelessness about what we're up against? And at worst, uh, either uh, malfeasance or co-option. Well, thank, uh, Frank, that's uh, uh, right. In, in my assessment, um, having listened to, to the speech, um, it was uh, disappointing. Um, and it was not just disappointing, but it was a uh, lost opportunity. 
uh, to boldly state what the United States is doing to confront the Chinese Communist Party, the enemy of the United States, not a competitor of the United States, uh, not a pacing challenge of the United States, but the enemy uh, of the United States. So Blinken did a yeoman's job of going around uh, the horizon, if you will, and talking about what the Biden administration was going to do uh, in this area or that area. Um, all measures, of course, that the Trump administration started uh, that uh, they're simply to some degree uh, continuing, but you don't have the leadership that we had in the Trump administration. We do not have the focus uh, on the Chinese Communist Party as the enemy of the United States, a direct threat to the American homeland, to America's interests, to American sovereignty, and to the existence uh, of uh, the United States and its allies, and all of those uh, in the free world who support uh, US against uh, the Chinese Communist Party. So it was a very disappointing speech, but one which is in accord with the Biden administration, where we do not have leadership, uh, which is focused on illuminating why the Chinese Communist Party is the enemy of the United States and explaining why the American people uh, need to resist it in conjunction with our allies and good people of goodwill uh, all around the world. So while he was touting it as, if you will, uh, uh, essentially the major speech uh, on China, uh, it fell sh fall short of, of that mark which sadly is in keeping uh, with the Biden administration's policies uh, on China, at least thus far. Thank you. Well, you're being charitable, uh, Brad, it seems to me, um, and calling it this a sort of shortfall. Uh, this seems to me to be fundamentally dereliction of duty. Um, and let me turn to you, Brian Kennedy. Uh, the speech, uh, of course, came on the heels of a presidential visit to Asia, uh, in which, among other things, the president made remarks about, in response to questions, to be sure, uh, Taiwan. Uh, I'd be very interested in your thoughts about not only what he said and what flowed from it, but how this may have played into Chinese calculations about uh, the window of opportunity being very much open for physical violent aggression perhaps, as Jeff has said, not just against Taiwan, but against us as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Frank. It, it, what struck me about what Biden said was it, it was more of a reflex than a thoughtful explanation of where we ought to be, uh, because immediately the White House communication staff started walking it back. And so are we going to defend Taiwan? Are we not going to defend Taiwan? Is there one China? And so it was. it, it came back to the one China policy and a broader policy, it seems to me, of detente. What, what, what is disturbing in all this, I mean, Jeff described what's disturbing from how China is thinking about this. And everyone should very much take that to heart, read that speech and, and absorb everything that's being said. What's equally disturbing is how we, the United States, have been thinking about China for so long. The Chinese look at us and they know we've exported 90% of our pharmaceutical industry, just the production of the raw materials to communist China. How long can we last if we're at war with communist China without being able to make our own pharmaceuticals? And they've made the calculation that American elites believe more in making money than in actually defending the American people. The Chinese know that American elites, especially the financial elites, have put at least $4 trillion of American retiree investments and just regular American investments in communist China. And so the Chinese look at America and they see we're an oligarchy by and large, we're being run by Wall Street, by the big tech companies, by big entertainment and media. We don't want to engage in a war. If the Chinese want to engage in war in Taiwan, you know, go right ahead. But we Americans, 
you know, the fact that we're willing to let so much of the key parts of our society necessary for our own survival be made in communist China would suggest that we're not serious. And this ongoing lack of seriousness, both by Republican and Democratic administrations and by the Congress, to making sure we're prepared for war, has to send a signal to China that they can get away with an awful lot. And I can just say, I believe, yes, we are, we are a target of the communist Chinese. They would like to take us down. But they also believe in the reunification of Taiwan with the mainland. They believe that's part of their territorial integrity, and they're going to achieve that, if not before attacking us, after attacking us. But at some point, they're going to do that because that's what they believe they need to do for their own country. And so whereas they're focused on what's good for China, we in the United States are not focused on what's good for America. And that's the thing that should should really uh, be seared into people's minds. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, we've had several questions from the audience, very thoughtful questions, I might add, uh, that I wanted to see if I could uh, ask you to address. Uh, you talk about the possibility, if not the high probability, given the evidence we now have, that the Chinese have calculated that the window in which they will strike is between now and basically the uh, congressional elections uh, and, and those of other uh, offices, obviously, elsewhere across the country. Uh, to the extent that that would be the timing. Presumably, uh, they've made calculations about what the effects of that would be on our electoral process, uh, on perhaps um, the nature of the response that we would be making to it. Uh, first of all, if you would uh, talk about how you think this attack might translate uh, into action against the United States, whether it is in fact uh, biological warfare, um, perhaps electromagnetic pulse attack. Um, presumably, they don't want to destroy the place if, as uh, Xi Chao Chen has said, uh, they hope to colonize it. But all of that um, seems to be a pretty sporty thing to do, not only just before our elections, uh, and but also before um, the coronation that she hopes for with his People's Congress uh, sometime in the month of November, as I understand it. Would you walk us through that? Yeah, well, uh, it is interesting that the uh, attack would take place before our elections in the fall. It's also interesting that this also coincides with Russia's invasion with Ukraine and that Putin went to China on February 4th. They made a joint statement saying they were the most powerful combination, power combination, even more powerful than anything during the Cold War. Um, one of the things, the Chinese sources that leaked this have other information that wasn't recorded. And I asked them about what the Chinese generals think about the Russian Ukraine invasion. And it, this was the fascinating answer. They said, well, the best Russian troops are not in Ukraine. They're in the far, they're hidden in the Far East. And that was, and I said, well, what's that about? Well, maybe they're going to invade Japan. They don't know, but they've, the Russians have some kind of force um, staged in the Far East. Um, this is also disturbing. And um, because I believe that Russia and China are allied, you've had General uh, Todd Walters. Our commander in NATO has underscored this again and again in, in talks that he's given in testimony before Congress over the last two years. Um, I think that our strategists are aware of this. And uh, so there is a, it seems to me with Russia's mobilizations and the war in, in Ukraine, there is this sense in which we have been drawn to Europe. You know, we've put more troops there and assets. We've used up a lot of strategic resources supporting the Ukrainians. This is almost like a diversionary situation where the really giant military preparations in China, and we're really drawn over here. So that is something that is troubling as well. So I, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but in the larger sense of things, 
No, I think you've uh, you've addressed it in part. Let, let me ask Brian. Uh, you've spent a lot of time, uh, Brian, on uh, the last election, uh, the presidential election of 2020 in particular. Uh, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on both how um, a war uh, would factor into uh, our own uh, midterm elections, uh, whether, as uh, one of our audience members asked, uh, the elections might be suspended, um, in fact, in the event of uh, hostilities of this kind. Uh, and, and if you might also comment on uh, Jeff's last closing point there, whether uh, we've been deliberately uh, distracted and, and drawn, uh, including drawn down in terms of our war stocks uh, as a result of this Ukraine ex exercise. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great question, Frank. Um, first, the elections. Uh, it, it strikes me that it's a very big deal to try to, you know, either cancel an American election or pause an American election. But things that we used to think were impossible today seem perfectly possible. And I wouldn't put it past anyone to, let's say there's the threat of a biological attack, a real attack, an EMP attack, if those kind of things happen, you're gonna have chaos in the United States as it is, right? Pure chaos. And so whether an election could even be achieved if that were the case is a separate thing. Probably if it was an EMP attack, we would be fighting for our lives quite literally. If there was a threat of a biological attack or something like that, you could see either a postponement of an election or the, the return to mail-in balloting or maybe even online balloting, something that would be completely inadequate from a, a fraud point of view, but may give the illusion that we're actually having an election. And if it didn't turn out the way many people believe it will turn out today with, with Republicans picking up seats in the, in the House, and perhaps the Senate, if there wasn't what, what people perceive as the red wave that should come through, people will doubt the authenticity and the very nature of our democratic republic will be called into question. So you could see that any kind of attack in the fall that affected our election would, would cause a crisis here, both perhaps physical, but certainly politically. So yes, I can see the Chinese from a purely strategic point of view, wanting to disrupt our elections. That's on the one hand. Second, I, I think Jeff's absolutely right. The mere fact that China and Russia seem to be working together in, in, in a strategic um, relationship that would put them in control of the world. I mean, Russia went first, as Jeff has articulated before on these webinars. Russia went first with Ukraine and China could easily go second with Taiwan. Now, we have been depleted. I mean, the, the, the talk out of Washington from some of our major defense industries is that we lack certain materials to replenish our own stores of military equipment and that it will take months and years to get right. I mean, we have lost in this country the industrial capacity to produce certain kind of equipment in a timely way. How many ships can we build? How many naval ships can we build of a certain kind? How long would it take to build an aircraft carrier today? How long would it take to produce fighter aircraft, missiles of any kind? The, 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 the foundations of our military system really are, are completely inadequate, let's just say, for the crises we find ourselves in today. And the mere fact that we haven't done more about this shows just how corrupt Washington is and how efficient that corruption uh, is in, in, in corroding our ability to, to wage war or to even provide for the common defense. And I, I would say as, just as a, a secondary point, but, but perhaps equally important, the United States has suffered through an attack with COVID-19, what we've called the CCP virus. And the United States to date has done nearly nothing about that from the country in which this originated, communist China. We have done nothing. And so the Chinese communists look at that and believe, again, not to, not to put too fine a point on this, 
But they look at that and they think we're not morally serious about our own national defense. And that needs to change and it needs to change now because anything that emboldens them will be extremely harmful to the future of this country. Frank. Brian, you've really made a, a point that I wanted to make sure we hammered home. Uh, the committee started, I believe, in March three years ago, very much with a focus on trying to both raise the alarm and get corrective actions taken. Uh, notably, I think, uh, to wean ourselves off of these supply chain dependencies, which I think there's no question whether it's rare earth minerals or, or flat screen displays or silicon chips or other things that are now integral to our military capabilities uh, are uh, offshored in some cases actually uh, from China. Um, this is uh, something that has not been heated before now and I think must be um, if possible at this time given this, especially this imminent threat. Uh, indeed, a war footing, it seems, is uh, what we better be on right quick. Um, I, I did just want to mention in passing uh, that on that point that you made, uh, Jeff, about Russia and China colluding, as, as Brian put it, I think. Uh, talk very quickly, if you would, we're almost out of time. I want to just make sure we get this point and one other in before we close, uh, about um, uh, Colonel Stan Lunyev, uh, this so former Soviet defector, and his insights into how uh, the Chinese and Russians would um, divide up North America, according to their plans for taking us out. Yeah, uh, Colonel Stanislav Lunyev was the highest ranking GRU defector. Um, I did some work with him many years ago. Uh, he uh, was at a meeting of the general staff in early 92, uh, the Russian general staff, he spoke fluent Mandarin, by the way, a Lunev worked in China in the 80s. And they said that there was a plan to invade North America, uh, that China was going to provide the troops for the lower 48, and that Russia was only going to invade Alaska and parts of Canada, and that they conceived of this as a long term preparation uh, against the US and that China wanted to own the lower 48, which is which is very funny because the secret speech of Chiao Chen basically says the same thing. So it's another data point uh, oh. in this thing. Very chilling indeed. Um, I want to close um, with a question basically to all three of you, if you would, maybe starting with you, uh, Brad Thayer. We have as a committee been working assiduously um, in response to questions we've gotten from our audience, among others, in terms of what do we do about all this, to argue that at a minimum, I mean, yes, do a war footing and yes, disengage from China and stop these dependencies on supply chains, uh, onshore capabilities that are clearly needed and, and so on, late in the day, though it may be. But something we could do immediately is to stop underwriting the Chinese Communist Party which is something, of course, we have been doing now, thanks to uh, what China calls its old friends on Wall Street, for the general population. And we're down to a matter of days before federal government employees, past and present, including military personnel, are going to have Wall Street reaching in and starting to migrate their retirement savings in the so-called thrift savings plan sent to China as well. In light of everything we've been talking about in the course of this hour, um, an imminent war with China, um, the degree to which China is engaged in horrific acts of uh, human rights abuses and, and other threatening behavior uh, towards us and others. Um, and more generally, the degree to which we are witnessing, uh, you know, this as being a very dubious investment, especially since full accounting of what these firms that um, people are investing in uh, are actually financially about. Brad Thayer, does it make any sense for the thrift savings plan at this point to be encouraging, indeed legitimating, uh, the idea and facilitating the investment of 
federal retirees' monies in China? Uh, no, Frank, it, it does not. And the committee uh, uh, has, uh, as you noted, uh, has worked very hard to call attention to, uh, to this issue. The idea that the United States is funding the rise of its enemy uh, is, um, is madness. And um, this is uh, a, a must end. It, it, it should never have happened. It should have ended a long time ago and it must end now. Um, with respect to the deeper issues that your question illuminates, Frank, uh, it's important first that we have leadership. Uh, the United States and its allies need leadership that focuses on the threat from the Chinese Communist Party and focusing not on platitudes or denying a Cold War, or that a Cold War exists. Indeed, it does. There's intense security competition uh, between the United States and China, and it's going to worsen because the Chinese want it to worsen. Uh, so we're in a Cold War that's very likely to become hot, and we need leadership, the leadership akin of, of Harry Truman and Eisenhower and Kennedy and the great Americans who fought this, um, these types of struggles before uh, and have won them. Secondly, the American people must be educated on this and that there has to be the recognition that Amer Western civilization, uh, American political principles, ideas, values have to be defended. They were defended in the past against previous enemies, and they need to be defended now against the Chinese Communist Party. And so that means an awareness of where your money is going, what apps are on your phone, uh, what China is doing, um, how the Chinese Communist Party is seeking to influence uh, American politics or the politics of our allies or of other uh, countries. America has tremendous strengths and we will win this confrontation with China, but it's going to require leadership. It's going to require cognizance from the American people uh, and uh, willingness to stand with our allies like Japan, Taiwan, India, Australia, our key NATO allies uh, to resist uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party. The strength that we have is rooted in American principles, our political institutions, and our history. Uh, that has to be reinforced. It has to be sustained. Uh, and if it can, recognizing it's under tremendous challenge and threat in a period of ideological upheaval in the United States, a clash between traditional liberalism and progressivism, uh, it must be sustained uh, so that the United States is able to win this contest uh, against the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Brad. Elegantly done. Um, we are almost out of time. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Brian and uh, uh, Jeff to make closing comments if you have any other on that last question or uh, any thoughts that you have that you would like to share with this audience briefly. Right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think that we are headed for an invasion uh, of something and the Chinese are getting ready for war. I don't think it's a question of whether we're going to have a war. It's a question of when and it's coming soon. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, yes, Frank, and thank you everybody who, who joined uh, this seminar today. Uh, I would say just two things, and that is one, uh, the government, our government, does not seem ready to, to defend us and so, or, or to defend us adequately. And so individual preparedness in the face of a you know, potential crisis, which looks, as Jeff just said, uh, very realistic, individual preparedness. Make sure you have food and water and that you can provide for your family and make sure you and your community can deal with whatever crisis comes our way. That seems a very important thing. And second, um, a redevotion to the American way of life is extremely important. My colleagues at the Claremont Institute focus on this all the time. A defense of the American way of life, politically, personally, uh, you know, Throughout, throughout all the circles you operate, you need to explain to people that what we're here for is the defense of the American way of life and everything that represents and everything that's, that's great about America, we need to defend it. And we have to get out of this 
world we live in where everybody simply talks to themselves through their cell phones and lives the world online. We need to get out of that and engage politically again with the American people, both at your churches, your communities, and what have you. We are Americans. We need to act like citizens and think like citizens. We need to elect the right representatives, and we need to act like a free people again. And we haven't done that much in the last year. Amen. Brian, and a very strong word on which to close. Um, let me just say, I am uh, deeply regretful that uh, there are so many really terrific questions that were posed by our audience, and we just don't have uh, an opportunity to get through them uh, in this call. I would like to commend to all of you resources that uh, our committee has been uh, developing and uh, making available that might answer some of those questions or at least provide content that um, will inform them. Uh, one is, of course, our website at presentdangerchina.org. Uh, that's the committee's own website. Uh, our Stop Vaccine Passports uh, Task Force, which has done some superb webinars as well, is at Stop Vax. V-A-X, stopvaxpassports.org. Um, and we have a campaign that is aimed at something uh, about this insanity, this, well, treasonous activity that is using American investors' money to underwrite the mortal threat that we are currently facing from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you can find out more about the macro campaign as at mad as hell campaign.org, because we think that's how you should feel, knowing that perhaps your money is being put into uh, these purposes. Uh, we also have one that's focused very directly on the thrift savings plan issue of the moment, and that is no TSP for ccp.org. Um, there are action Items at many of those, <clears throat> excuse me, at many of those sites, which I hope that you will take advantage of uh, to get in touch directly with your elected representatives and others about what's being done here. Uh, we need your help, needless to say. The hour, as you've heard in the course of these very, very troubling remarks, is very late, um, but we are Americans. And uh, to Brian's point, I think if we behave like them, uh, we may get through this in one piece. In the meantime, let me just simply say thank you to all of you for listening, both those of you listening at the moment and those of you that will be listening to the recording when it is available. And uh, for closing comments of her own, I'm very pleased to turn the podium now over to our Executive Secretary of the Committee on the Present Danger of China, Didi Logason. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. A video of this webinar will post to presentdangerchina.org within a day or two of the conclusion of our program. Please share it with your colleagues and other networks. And join us next week at the same time for another Committee on the Present Danger China webinar on the CCP's unrestricted warfare being waged against America and the free world. Thank you for being here and goodbye.